thank you very much. And uh, thank you, sweetie. Uh, so um, I was thinking about what I would talk about today. And since I'm getting old, I have found out that I'm not the oldest person in the room, um, but close. Uh, I looked back over my career. And uh, one of the things that I take pride in is when an opportunity presents itself, you, you uh, take advantage of that. And it's exciting. It's new, right? And um, uh, it's amazing what things can happen. And so um, I had been a, a synaptic physiologist uh, for my PhD. And I picked Dennis Noble's lab for my postdoc uh, because he was the person who was doing the computer models of cardiac electrical activity. If it was today, I might have chosen Urim. But in any event, um, uh, since my background had been in chemical physics, I um, was very interested in these computer models. Instead, uh, what we did is a, a lot of experiments on uh, the cardiac pacemaker current. And so starting in 1974 and continuing into uh, the late 1990s, we just did experiments on cardiac electrophysiology and looked at different drugs that affect the pacemaker activity, um, persistent sodium currents, et cetera. And then something happened in the 1990s. Uh, I was part of a program project at Columbia University uh, that Michael Rosen uh, was the PI on. And uh, we discussed the fact that the genes underlying the pacemaker current IF had been cloned. And in principle, we, we had this PPG from 1983 till 2009, so we kept it a long time. And this was around 1999, 2000. We said, well, now that we know what the gene is and we can express it, and I had learned to express ion channels because Sui had forced me in order to keep him as a student to learn how to do that, um, maybe we could try to make a biological pacemaker. Okay. And so uh, this work uh, starts around the year 2000, and it's based on the Human Genome Project and the fact that the genes underlying um, the current IF in the heart had been cloned. Now up is down and down is up on this. So if I go this way, ah, it's the other way. Okay, so uh, this is a relatively quick introduction. Why make a biological pacemaker? Um, it turns out electronic pacemakers don't respond to the demands of exercise and emotion, although they're getting better and better at doing that with feed forward stuff. They require monitoring and maintenance and battery replacement, and sometimes you get infections in the electrodes and the leads. And uh, uh, obviously, with pediatric patients, they grow, and that's a real pain. Um, you can get um, infection. Uh, you, you can't go into an MRI uh, with a pacemaker. And the placement of the electrode is not placed to optimize cardiac output. It can't be, because it's limited. So the problem is they had multiple drawbacks, and we saw as the solution biological pacemakers. And that opportunity had presented itself to us because of the cloning uh, by uh, uh, Steve Siegelbaum's group, uh, Bina Centoro, and uh, also Martin Beal's group in, in Germany of the uh, pacemaker genes. So again, I don't have to tell you all of this. It's just a repeat of saying that this would be a cure, not a palliation, if we could make it last a lifetime. So what is a biological pacemaker? Well, uh, normal pacing in the heart starts in the sinoatrial node, which is the primary pacemaker, because the whole heart is electrically connected. And the place that beats, the, that has the highest rate of uh, generating action potentials is the place that's going to overdrive any other pacemakers in the heart. So in order to create a biological pacemaker, oh, we needed to, I need this, uh, recreate 
pacemaker function but not recreate the sinoatrial node itself. The sinoatrial node is a very complicated structure with primary pacemaking tissue and secondary pacemaking tissue and spe special exit pathways into the atrium, et cetera, et cetera, all of which are very complicated and certainly couldn't repro be reproduced by our very simple-minded idea. And ours was really incredibly simple-minded. Um, so. The question is, how do you build a biological pacemaker? What's necessary? So if you take the sinus node, uh, after the action potential, there's a period called phase four, or diastolic depolarization, in which there's a spontaneous depolarization. And when there's a depolarization, it means there's a net inward current. And in ventricular muscle, for example, you're in a circumstance where there's no net inward current, it's at a, a resting potential. There's zero net current. So the exercise is to convert this tissue into a tissue that has a diastolic depolarization that can pace. It's as simple as that. Um, so next slide. So uh, we were not alone in this field, and we were not the first people in. Uh, the first person in uh, was uh, uh, Jay Adelberg. And what he did is he, oh, um, so I have to do this. Nope, I have to do this and this again. So what he did is he increased sympathetic tone by expressing beta 2 adrenergic receptors, first with just the plasmid and then with adenovirus. Okay. And it was interesting, it was a proof of concept, but it wasn't going to be going anywhere. And then um, the next one that came out uh, was from Eduardo Marban's group, and what they did is they downregulated with a dominant negative IK1, and in that work they certainly got pacemaker activity, but was, what was also clear in the paper, if you look carefully, is that IK1 plays a role in final repolarization of the action potential. So if you look carefully, the action potential duration was appreciably prolonged. And then about a year later, he came out with a paper saying, we can't use this technology because it creates a long QT syndrome. OK, so then uh, we came along, and we were really involved in using native HCN2 genes in which we delivered by adenovirus to the Purkinje system. And we were able to get a, beat of, a rate of about 50 beats per minute. And then uh, we engineered HCN genes. And uh, one of the things we thought, well, maybe we could change the voltage dependence. And if it was more positively activating, we might be in a situation to get more pacemaker current. It turned out um, we did get more activation, but the overall expression of the gene was lower. And so the rate was the same. So then what we did is um, we actually um, modified the gene uh, to make it a chimera, where it turns out in the heart there are um, three HCN isoforms. HCN1, which has the fastest kinetics, but the poorest response to the autonomic nervous system. HCN2, which had me intermediate kinetics and responded to the uh, cyclic AMP and PKA, and, and HCN4, okay? And so it, it turned out if you made a chimera of HCN2 where you had HCN212, what you had is the C-terminus is where the uh, responsiveness to the autonomic hormones happened, and HCN1 had the fastest kinetics, so it would, in principle, go faster. And indeed, we created a, a pacemaker that uh, its basal rate was about 190 beats a minute. So uh, the, the problem exists, which still exists, is how do you use that information to create uh, a, a biological pacemaker which would have the ideal rate? And let, let, let's just say that with SWE's help, uh, it's clear that such a thing can be done. Okay, and one could literally pick one's rate if one wanted to, but that's not the topic of, of this. Um, it turned out 
uh, that Eduardo Marban's group then came out with an interesting idea uh, of using a transcription factor that uh, actually changes ventricular myocytes uh, to become uh, sinus node cells. Now, it, it turns out there are a couple of problems uh, intrinsically with the work in the sense that um, Ron Joyner years ago talked about impedance mismatches when you actually uh, put sinus node cells next to even a directly next to atrial cells and causing excitation. But there were other problems with this particular work. Uh, the control gene, uh, which was GFP, uh, caused a beating rate in the ventricle of um, uh, 65 beats a minute. And uh, the TBX cells were 80 beats a minute. Okay, So it was only about a 20% increase. And in the Purkinje system, in the human, the average rate is 15 to 40 beats a minute. And if you increase it by 20%, you're up to 48 beats a minute at most. And that's not, not acceptable. And the, the other problem was uh, when he actually sh tried to demonstrate um, autonomic responsiveness, he took the, put the animal under anesthesia, which eliminates autonomic input. And then he added isoprenaline so that he could increase the rate. But the surprising thing was that the basal rate under anesthesia was exactly the same as the GFP. And so that made one wonder what was really going on in that circumstance, which I didn't understand. And it was only a marginal increase over uh, the GFP in terms of its isoprenaline responsiveness. So uh, the basic bottom line on all of this is it was all done with adenoviruses. And they only last about three weeks. Okay, And uh, none of these were going to produce the perfect rate without side effects, et cetera, et cetera. And so people went on uh, to look at using gene and cell therapy, or just cell therapy, to create a biological pacemaker. And uh, again, the whole idea is just to increase net inward current during diastole. That's all you have to do. That's what creates a biological pacemaker. And um, uh, Leo Gepstein demonstrated uh, that he could use ESCs and create a biological pacemaker which integrated via gap junctions. Okay? So the cells were added, and then they became electrically connected. And uh, he had some success. Not all animals uh, responded, but it was a proof of principle. Uh, our group uh, tried just for the sake of it taking SA node myocytes from a given dog, dissociating them, and then putting them in the ventricle. So that would be a, a little bit like what Eduardo was doing uh, with the TBX18. We were asking whether a sinus node cell or group of cells could uh, generate pacemaker activity. It did but it did it at a rate of 40 to 50 beats per minute, so it really wasn't ideal. Not that anybody would take somebody's sinus node dissociated and put it back in. It was only marginally effective. Uh, Eduardo actually did something uh, quite interesting. He used fibroblasts, and what he did is he transfected them with an HCN gene, and then he fused them with myocytes using polyethylene glycol. So it was the antifreeze approach. And it worked um, for a period of time. And that's never been pursued. Um, we also uh, uh, recently published work in which we um, uh, used IPS cells. And uh, we um, differentiated them to be beating cardiac myocytes. And we put them into a canine heart. And the, the animal was under um, immunosuppression. So under those circumstances, we didn't have to worry about rejection. And uh, what happened is we did very well. Uh, the pacing was at an appropriate rate, 50, 60, maybe even a little more beats per minute. And it lasted 12 weeks until the animal got very sick from the immunosuppression and all that. 
And remember, this was a, a xenograft. So, I mean, there really was a huge immune response. And we had to take the animals down. But it really showed an enormous promise. And so, uh, it, when we published this in 2017, um, there was a, a big editorial and it said, now is the time we're going to get biological pacemakers. And so, we said, oh, we'll form a company and we'll make biological pacemakers. And then we found the bad news that if you were going to do this for a patient, first of all, it would take a month to, to make your iPS cells from the patient, right? So there'd be no immune rejection. And uh, then it would cost $100,000 per patient. And so it was financially not, not plausible. Um, and uh, in the middle of that, um, I'll tell you two things at this point. One, we've abandoned any of, of these approaches and we're now uh, focused on using an adeno-associated viral approach. And they last forever if the cells don't divide and adult cardiac myocytes don't divide. So essentially, it could be there forever. And the key thing is having the appropriate construct which is being based on the type of um, mutagenesis that SWE is uh, very involved in. And uh, as I said, we could create, uh, in principle, cells that would drive the human heart at any desired rate, in principle, from any desired location. So it might be one construct for the kidney fibers and a different construct for the atrium and a different construct for ventricle, of course it would be. Uh, and then you'd have to choose the rate you want in any of those. Yes? Um, uh, making the iPS cells, having, remember you're using the patient's own cells. So it, it comes from the, the um, um, making the cells, uh, having a, a large enough number of them, having the technical support to do it, having all the course of the um, medium that you have to have. And it just added up. And clearly, uh, the number that came back was $100,000 a patient. And the number that comes back for adeno-associated virus is less than $1,000 a patient. So clearly, it's the Uh, so, um, uh, remember, we're going to be delivering, in, in our case, a gene, okay? And we're going to pick the target area to put the gene. So we could put it in the, uh, yeah, by catheter injection. And if we wanted to put it in the conducting system, we could. If we wanted to put it in a certain area of the ventricle, we could. And if we wanted to put it in the atrium, we could. IV delivered AMDs. So yeah, right. Them, but they have a motor yeah. Specific. Yeah, yeah. It would be uh, cardiac specific. Um, or yeah. neutral. Or well, yeah, even more so. Yes. Uh, yeah. Um, uh, but the key point is the delivery is plausible. Uh, the the um, gene can be designed, and um, we know it can. And um, the safety is pretty good with adeno-associated virus. And indeed, we don't have to worry about expression in other tissues. So I think that answers uh, the questions that you asked. So, so at the more global scale of, of cardiac function, right? right. <clears throat> First of all, you, know, you talk about the SA node architecture, but the SA node architecture is very important to its function. Because of the impedance matching. Yes. Because of different regions of different frequency series. Right, absolutely. You know, apply like vagal stimulation. Yeah, 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 yeah. Is anybody even thinking about trying to do something about this architecture? No, uh, the, the basic argument here is simple is better, okay? And in this particular case, 
we've had experience where we just injected HCN2 into the conducting system and it worked beautifully for the period of time with the adenovirus for three weeks. Uh, we actually injected with adenovirus um, a combination of two genes, uh, SKM1, uh, which is the s uh, skeletal muscle sodium channel, and HCN2. And in fact, we had pacing rates in the 60s, and the, uh, the backup pacemaker never got activated. Okay. What about the sequence of? Uh, the sequence of activation is based on where you place it. Okay, and there's, you, yeah. And the idea, one of the advantages of a biological pacemaker is in principle you can put it to maximize cardiac contraction, which you can't do with an electronic pacemaker. So uh, it's part pie in the sky, but we've made a lot of different biological pacemakers in a lot of different ways. And um, I think the step from here to the clinic is much less than the step that we had up till now. Uh, but what I wanted to uh, follow this is not with how we're getting to the clinic. Uh, uh, and it's a team that includes Dario DeFrancesco and Dennis Noble and Mike Rosen and Swee and uh, a couple of people in Holland, Gerk Boink, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but to tell you about something that changed my whole research direction. Good. Okay. I, I looked and I said, I started at 5 o'clock. It's, it's almost over, but it's actually only half over. Okay. So um, I didn't talk about this. So uh, I had worked in Dennis Noble's lab, and Dennis, there's a book called uh, Electric Current Flow in Excitable Cells, and he had just finished that with Julian Jack and Dick Chen, and he needed somebody to edit it. So the deal was I edited the book, okay, to find any mathematical errors, and there were a few, but not many. And we would play some squash, and then we would come back to his house, and I would be able to ask questions about cable theory. And, and so um, when we failed um, to get exactly what we wanted with uh, uh, gene therapy, I was thinking, well, maybe we could do it by having cells integrate into the heart and have them carrying a gene of interest, uh, which was the HCN2 gene. And uh, it would have to integrate via gap junctions. OK. So next. Uh, this is just a, a series of papers that we published doing this, all old. OK. And the idea was basically that you have a ventricular myocyte, you have a stem cell with a pacemaker gene, and the combination of the two would allow the cell to pace. And indeed, uh, we published a paper where we did exactly that, and we showed that we could cause it to pace. We could eliminate, I could have shown the movies if that was all this was about, with carbonoxalone, uh, uncoupling them, they stopped pacing. If we blocked IF, they stopped pacing. If we washed it all out, they started pacing again. So it all conceptually worked, OK? Uh, and I guess this is a one in which uh, here's a single ventricular my up. Oh, here I go again. Here's a single ventricular myocyte, and obviously no pacemaker activity. And this is one that's actually coupled, in this case, to a HeLa cell that was carrying HCN2. And you could see that it generated pacemaker activity in the ventricular myocyte. So it was simple as that a two-cell um, pacemaker. It, it required the ventricular myocyte for all the other ion currents, and it required the mesenchymal stem cell um, for uh, the pacemaker current. And so we had to show that we could express the, the pacemaker current. And this just shows uh, uh, um, no HCN in an HMSC, overexpression, uh, by putting the gene in via electroporation, it shows the voltage dependence. And the next slide shows that we did have autonomic responsiveness. Uh, we would shift more positive with uh, ISO, and uh, we would uh, shift back. We had accentuated antagonism in, in, in the ventricle. Um, uh, so it only shifted back to the control levels. And we had reported that, actually Daria and I had reported that in 1990, a uh, difference between ventricular pacing 
and uh, sinus node pacing, that um, ACH does not have a direct effect. It only reverses the effects of isoproterenol, which is called accentuated antagonism. And then we put the, the uh, cells in, and uh, this is the rhythm while we were doing the injection. And then we got a spontaneous beating rate that was really rather nice. And we had no long pauses. Uh, um, uh, after we um, uh, stopped the overdrive pacing, uh, the longest pause we had was 1.3 seconds. So we could drive at a fast rate and then turn off the fast driving and then ask, how long will it take for our endogenous biological pacemaker to take over? And it was about 1.3 seconds, which was acceptable. Not great, but acceptable. And we got beating rates in the um, high 50s, sometimes in the 60s, and went on for six weeks, and it was great. And we had asked how many cells we needed to inject. We had that all sorted out. And so we injected much more than the saturating amount needed, so we didn't have to worry whether we were on a dose-response curve for rate. And uh, it was great, and we thought we were going to have a functional biological pacemaker. And then between six and eight weeks, it disappeared. And it, the reason it disappeared is not because the cells died. It's because the cells left. Okay, uh, HMSCs are, are uh, useful at sites of injury. And uh, they respond to paracrine factors, particularly SDF1. And apparently, they just said, well, I may have gap junctions here, but who the hell cares? And I'm just going to pick up, and I'm going to leave. Okay, And so this lasted for six to eight weeks. And then I spent uh, an interesting week or two up at uh, University of Albany, which has a nanotechnology center, uh, wondering whether we might be able to in, uh, encapsulate the cells. But it was a difficult problem because if we encapsulated the cells, they still had to make gap junctions outside the capsule. And so it also had to have sufficient mechanical stability when it contracted around it. And uh, basically, we felt that at that point, the nanotechnology wasn't ready. Okay. So we were left with this very interesting observation. And the question is, what could we do with it? And again, uh, serendipity occurred. It turns out in the 90s, um, people discovered um, there are introns and there are exons. And the exons code for proteins. And nobody knew what the introns did until Craig Mello and Andrew Firestone uh, discovered um, microRNAs and siRNAs. Okay? And um, they obviously could regulate gene function. And um, this was now around 2004, and we had realized we weren't going to make it with this. But we, we had an interesting thing. We had a cell that could carry a package. And as long as it could integrate into tissue, it in principle could deliver the package if the package was able to go through gap junctions. Okay. Now, at the time, um, the highest, largest molecular weight uh, compound going through a gap junction was one kilodalton. And uh, siRNAs were four kilodaltons. But siRNAs are rod shaped. And uh, so uh, it turned out we had um, a molecular simulation of the molecule, so we knew what the minor diameter was, and it was about two angstroms less than the gap junction channel. And uh, then we, we had uh, a, a very good theoretical collaborator in Rick Mathias, who actually uh, calculated basically what angles would be possible for it to, in principle, diffuse uh, th through the gap junction. And uh, so, um, we were in a very fortunate position, and this was all because of one of the collaborators from our program project grant, uh, which was Rich Robinson, who uh, read, the, read the newspaper every day with his uh, coffee. And he said to us, have you ever heard of 
siRNA. And at that time, I hadn't heard about siRNA. I was quite ignorant. And it turned out that uh, Peter Brink, who's an excellent gap junction person, uh, was in our department, and he owed me some money, actually. So, so I said, I don't want you to study IF, because that's what he thought he was going to be doing. Uh, I want to know whether siRNA can go through gap junctions. And so, uh, first of all, I, we found the cells, the HMSCs in the heart. And uh, Vimentin showed, ah, oh, I'm terrible at this. Vimentin showed that they were mesenchymal. And uh, uh, we used human CD44, which is on the HMSCs. It's, it's not in um, uh, canine tissue. So we were able to find the cells. And they were clearly there when it was pacing. And they were clearly not there when it was not pacing. And there was no intermediate stage of apoptosis. They just disappeared. OK. So what we had is proof of concept, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and um, we then were very happy we had done what a lot of other people had done thought about biological pacing, um, had certain ideas about it, were able to show that conceptually they could work, but all of them had limitations in terms of their duration or their rate. Okay, And so, as I said, we continued to pursue that um, in a consortium group, uh, and we're hoping to uh, get the funding to come go to market uh, with a biological pacemaker with an adeno-associated virus. And in fact, uh, Goldman Sachs is quite happy to bring the company to market, but we're having more trouble getting the initial 5 to $10 million investment because we haven't picked our construct. And the reason we didn't pick our construct, because we can pick different rates. And uh, for example, there's an uh, orphan uh, application for pediatric pacemakers. And so that rate would be different. You know, if that was the one we'd go for, we'd get many hundreds of million dollars for the pediatric application. So that's all the business of it, and you know, I'm not really interested. Uh, but what happened is um, we had these cells. They made gap junctions. Um, Rich Robinson had this great idea about why don't we check to see whether siRNA could go through. And if it could go through, then we could target siRNA um, to a specific tissue if that tissue made gap junctions, right? Well, may express connections and was capable of forming gap junctions. Um, so I, I think I showed you back here. No, I didn't. OK, it comes later. Sorry about this. So anyway, it, it turns out, although siRNA and antisense oligonucleotides uh, were really became a hot thing in the 1990s, uh, to this date, there's one product um, with siRNA for a hereditary disease of the liver. And it's uh, done with nanoparticles through the portal circulation. Otherwise, if they had to do it systemically, the concentrations would be so large that it would be very, very toxic. Okay? So local circulation is one way you could do it. Okay? Uh, the other product that's gone to market is a product um, of antisense um, uh, for spinal muscular atrophy. And that's the pediatric form of ALS. Okay? Uh, it's really different, but there are uh, relationships between them. And in their case, they were able to put 10 micromolar of their antisense into the CNS. Okay. And they, they won awards for actually it working. And it would cost $750,000 the first year, and then $375,000 for the treatment for every year thereafter. And then Novartis came out uh, with a viral treatment that cured the disease. And so they had spent all this money. They even won a prize. And in the end, they don't really have much of a market. 
Anyway, so siRNA delivery has been a problem. Okay. So we thought, why not consider um, putting the siRNA into a mesenchymal stem cell and have it uh, have a um, a payload that might target a cell, and if it's a cancer cell, kill it, for example. And uh, it turns out with siRNA, uh, the native siRNA that cells make lasts 6 to 12 hours. Uh, there are chemically modified siRNAs that can last weeks to months. And that's what these companies, Al Nylon and Ionis, they work on the chemistry of these things. And then, of course, uh, you could put a plasmid in that expresses the siRNA, and it could be absolutely persistent expression. So the question is, would it work? And first we needed to know, well, connexin 43 uh, uh, it turned out to be present in the HMSCs. Where would it be? And it, what's uh, relevant is that it was pretty much everywhere and particularly present in a lot of tumors. Okay, So that was nice. And it was actually interesting. It turns out you may or may not know that the liver does not have connexin 43. It has connexins 26 and 32, which are beta connexins, and would not couple with connexin 43. But liver cancer makes connexin 43, which is kind of interesting. Anyway. So we looked at our cells, and they have connexin 40. And they had connexin 43. This was the immunostaining. This was the Weston blot. It was there. OK. Next, uh, this is the dual patch clamp technique that's usually used to study gap junctions. You, you can pass things in from one side and then look at it appear in the other side. In this case, this is Peter Brink's classic slide, where he is passing Lucifer yellow from a first cell to a second cell, and you can see it lighting up even within 10 minutes. So it moved pretty quickly, but lucifer yellow is a very small molecular weight compound. So what this is is HMSCs that are coupled to each other in which we put a oligonucleotide in, and you could see that they're cu it's coupled to two other cells, and it's actually uh, going into the other two cells. Okay. Uh, so it turns out that it did permeate gap junctions quite well. You could see it visibly um, by putting uh, a cyano tag on the end of it. Uh, you could calculate the diffusion coefficient, uh, et cetera, et cetera. How, how long uh, so, so the, the HMSCs or the the, um, uh, the, the, the oligonucleotides were... In general, what size? An sRNA is 21 oligonucleotides, okay, and is about 4 uh, kilodaltons. And that passes. Um, not remarkably fast, but the KD for our targets tend to be in the sub-nanomolar range. And we found that we could load the HMSCs, which is with as much as 500 nanomolar siRNA. Okay. And so anyway, I'll just show you some of the very early work we did. Um, so first, we just tried different siRNAs uh, just to see whether it would kill uh, cancer cells. And it was, oh, I did it again. So here's somebody who doesn't learn very easily. <laughs> Anyway, we tried, this was the control rate of growth of these PC3 uh, prostate cancer cells. And this is with um, AKT siRNA. And I think this is uh, uh, MIA34. This was the AKT siRNA. And this was MIR16. So MIR16 was the best of the group. And um, uh, it works through a, a variety of pathways, uh, which include cell cycle arrest. Uh, it, it actually inhibits migration, which is useful. And it can also induce uh, senescence and, and apoptosis. So this is just direct delivery. 
And what we were able to show was that MIA-16 was the one who induced the most apoptosis. So the next question was, what about cold culture? Could we put our HMSCs together with the cancer cells, and would we able to see slowing of growth? Okay. And remember, we're using uh, human HMSCs that have uh, specific uh, surface markers that allowed us to sp uh, separate the cells from in cold culture and count them. So uh, we found that direct transfection only had a relatively small effect on the growth of the HMSCs themselves. And this is a very relevant thing. So when we started this, it was very, very important to pick a payload that didn't kill our delivery cell, but did kill our target cell. Okay. Now, in the last year, we've created a patent that allows us to change the genetics of our delivery cell so that any siRNA in the genome can be delivered. Okay. And we have the cells, and they, it works great. Okay. Um, so that expands the ability to choose a very toxic payload and know that your delivery cells are going to be fine. Okay. But this happened way before that. And so the next thing we did is we did them in cold culture. We looked at four days. And what we saw was uh, the control situation with the control HMSCs and PC3 cells one to one, and uh, with the HMSCs containing the MIR-16. Uh, they started to grow more and more slowly. So it was encouraging, but the main question was, would we really be able to do this with a tumor in vivo? And so we um, uh, injected the PC3 cells um, uh, subcutaneously in the mouse, and it was a nude mouse. And uh, we then uh, um, had a million cells. We let them grow for a while, and then at about two weeks, we in injected either nothing or the HMSCs containing the MIR-16, or I'll show you in a separate figure, HMSCs containing nothing. Okay. So in the next slide, what you see is this uh, uh, line should really extend to here. Uh, because this is the control group where we injected only solution. We didn't inject HMSCs. Okay. And under those circumstances, you can see uh, that the tumor growth was dramatically slower. And uh, this is our, our very first try. And now we're in a situation where we have, instead of inducing 20% uh, apoptosis, we induce 90% apoptosis with some of our payloads. So, and we've done it with uh, prostate cancer and pancreatic cancer, both in vitro and in vivo, but a different um, siRNA. I can't show that because it's proprietary to the um, stem cell company that had funded us based on, on this initial work. Uh, they gave us um, $3 million for three years to, to pursue it. Anyway, uh, when we took out the tumor, we could see that the tumor weight was much reduced. And we did fluorescence measurements. And you could see the tumor size is dramatically reduced. And um, when we actually just did the control with HMSCs alone, okay, the HMSCs, because of their ability to secrete factors that are angiogenic, actually caused an increase in the size of the tumor by themselves rather than a reduction. So our results were fighting against uh, the HMSC um, endogenous properties. So in conclusion, uh, there are multiple sRNAs that can uh, reduce PC3 growth. We used MIR-16 in this study. Uh, we now have far more effective sRNAs. Um, um, and you can actually buy um, from companies what's called a death cocktail, which contains several siRNAs. And it's 
really useful if you want to know whether you're delivering things. Um, if, if, if it doesn't respond to the death cocktail, the, the, the thing is you're probably not getting it in. So anyway, uh, we were able to show it, uh, in co-culture uh, that, um, uh, that um, uh, the HMSCs, which were co-cultured, had marginal effects, uh, but we could truly reduce um, the, the growth of the tumor cells in co-culture after four days. And uh, with sub-epidermal injection, um, we were able to inject one million PC3 cells on day zero, which were about five million PC3 cells at day 14, and inject one million of our HMSCs with their payload and have a rather dramatic effect on uh, slowing uh, the growth. And um, uh, we, we have evidence that the major pathway is through gap junctions. Um, although you can have uh, exocytosis and endocytosis, it turns out to be less than 20%. Yeah, yeah oh, sure. Have you done a local gene expression analysis on the tumors that you explant? Um, so um, we, if you're asking us whether we've done it before and after we've taken it out, um, uh, no. Okay. So I, I, I think my, my guess would be, so we've done it with um, something much more potent. And instead of putting it subcutaneously, uh, we put um, the PC3 cells in the mouse prostate and the P PANC1 cells in the mouse pancreas. And then we either injected them with our stem cells carrying this much more potent thing. And uh, in both cases, we extended life two to three fold of the animals. But your question is a very good one. And, and, and the answer is, I, I saw a, 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 a my coworker on this is um, a fellow who works on PI3 kinase. And he had me um, uh, look at a, uh, a, a seminar uh, and whose name, again, escapes me, but it was on uh, genetic origins of cancer versus other things. And I didn't know, for example, every time a cell divides, there are uh, three errors that are made. And those three errors normally don't matter at all. Uh, rarely, they're the basis of evolution, or they're the basis of a tumor population that has changed. And I think the answer to your question is when you do chemotherapy on cancers and essentially eliminate them, you're eliminating the total initial population, but that cell division actually resulted ultimately in a small subset of those which are immune to the original chemotherapy, whatever it is. So the answer is we're killing the cells and they're also, in principle, um, mutating and ultimately becoming resistant. And that's true for all cancer therapy. Um, so I, I think it's very interesting. And, and the reason I, I chose this to talk about was you start one place and you're really interested. I, got it, I started studying pacemaker activity for 25 years. And, and then gene therapy uh, came around and we knew the genes for the pacemaker. So why not try to make a biological pacemaker? It was fun and hopefully we'll succeed yet, but you know, I'm 71 now, so who knows. And uh, then another opportunity presented itself. We had a delivery cell that could deliver a package. And the question is, what package should we deliver? Now, we chose siRNA um, because it was interesting. Nobody had ever tried to see whether it went through gap junctions. So some basic science was being done. And 
Peter was paying me back for my my help, and and um, then um, it was possible to to think about whether we could do cancer therapy, and we got a stem cell company involved in being interested, and that allowed us to be, develop better payloads, and then they stopped funding us recently, and then we discovered how to make any payload possible. It was sort of nice because they didn't own the patent, we did. And now the only thing that's left is homing. So if you want to do it systemically, you have to home it to the tumor. And so Novartis has already done that with CAR T therapy, right? What they've taken is a natural killer cell, okay? And their homing was very complicated because their natural killer cell has to be activated and then granules are released, et cetera, right? And um, they chose B-cell lymphoma because uh, my, my colleague who's the PI3 kite guy is a hematologist oncologist and he said basically you can live without B-cells. So you put the CAR T in, the T-cells recognize the antigen on the B-cells and any B cell, whether it be tumor or not tumor, is going to be killed because the T cells remember forever. Okay, So they want to move, uh, Novartis wants to move towards solid tumors. But the problem with solid tumors is there are no specific antigens for, say, the pancreas. The, uh, most popular one, which they occasionally use for a, a blood test, I think is CD199 or something like that. And it turns out it's also in the kidney and it's in the gut. Okay, So if they were going to try and use the T cells, they had multiple problems. One, they had to get the cells to the solid tumor, and the T cells are not very good at permeating stroma. Okay. The second thing they had to do is make sure when they actually uh, uh, made contact with, with the um, tumor that their homing technology uh, worked. And it's apparent that it's only worked moderately well. And so uh, the third problem is that if they do cure pancreatic cancer, then they're going to have continuous problems in the kidney and in the gut because those same T cells will be chewing up cells there. Now, in our case, we've made a killer cell. Uh, the homing technology we need is much easier than the homing technology that they have because we don't have to activate anything. We already have a killer cell. And the other advantage we have is that HMSCs secrete matrix metalloproteinases, and so they can actually permeate um, through stroma. And, and so we're in the process now of putting together a presentation uh, to try and get Novartis interested in going in this direction. Yeah? Are you getting the siRNAs in for the HMSCs? Yeah. Uh, no, so, uh, We've done it two ways. Uh, one is lipofectin, and the, the, uh, um, it's a kit, you know. And the problem is the amount of um, uh, um, lipofectin, lipofectamine, or whatever it is, that's required when you uh, try to get more than 500 nanomolar in, you're actually toxic. So that's the limit of what we could get in that way. Uh, we've also done electroporation, which when I was doing the biological pacemaker and putting the HCN2 gene into the stem cells, we had maybe 50% survival at best. And so we, we tried a new one, and we got 90% uh, transfection and virtually 100% survival. So we could, we could actually do it that way. And so those are the two ways um, uh, that we, we do it. Um, and we've tried the chemically modified stuff, which does last longer. And so how will the, uh, the HMSCs not be recognized as foreign and like? Well, it, it turns out that HMSCs are, are allergenic. 
So they secrete into Lucan <laughs> a 7 or 11, I forgot which one it is, that hides them from the immune system. So when we delivered uh, our HMSCs to create the biological pacemaker, it was a xenograft with no rejection. Now, that won't last indefinitely, but for, for months and months it can last. And so, um, in our case, we wouldn't have a lifelong therapy, and that's a disadvantage as well as an advantage. However, we could target the therapy for as long as we want based on the side effects that it would have because of the non-specificity of the antigen on the surface of the solid tumor. And um, think about putting the don't eat me signal on the surface. The, the what? Have you ever heard of the don't eat me signal? It's uh, right, yeah, it, it, yeah, anyway. I, <laughs> I, I, I always so tend to. A, So I guess maybe the interleukins are doing something like that for, for the HMSCs in, in hiding them. From, they're called uh, stealth, immune stealth. Um, and, and so uh, the company that uh, funded me is an HMSC company, and they have a subpopulation called HM progenitor cells. And... Um, uh, they do all their work allergenically, and they have several products that have already been a graft versus host um, uh, product for refractory graft versus host disease in, in pediatric patients. Uh, they now have just been approved for intractable back pain. And, and uh, this is all with allergenic cells. So. Yes. Is it possible to engineer your HMSCs to knock out these angiogenic <coughs> factors? Oh, I'm sure. Yeah, I'm sure. Oh, oh, yeah. Yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah, it's a question of cost-benefit analysis um, for, for what you're doing, right? And uh, um, if your HMSCs are delivering a payload that's incredibly toxic, uh, then you don't have to worry about uh, bringing greater blood supply to dead cells is basically the situation. Any question from students? As this is related to the um, uh, to the your biological pacemakers, uh, correct me if my understanding is wrong at any point, but it looks like you haven't yet developed like full targeting to specific parts of the conduction system. Um, no, th that's not an issue. I mean. Uh, we can use the catheter to place it anywhere we want. Okay. So th that's not the issue. The, the issue is that the native gene is just a little bit too slow. Um, this combination gene that works very well with the skeletal muscle sodium channel, uh, the, um, since the sodium channel is not four subunits, it's a single gene that's too large to be put in an adeno-associated virus. So that's just not reasonable at this particular point in time. But as I said, um, intrinsically, if you know what the reasons are for the difference between the 50 beats per minute rate and the 180 beats per minute rate, and you have control of all of the um, base pairs that are responsible for those differences, you can, in principle, make whatever rate you want. Yeah. Uh, pacemaker. Did you observe any differences in like, ventricular kinematics? Um, so, um, I'm, I'm trying to, we, we really didn't look, okay? In the long term, uh, if you have a, a heart failure patient and you, you need a pacemaker there, uh, what you would do, would you, you, you do a study of where the optimal place to, uh, you'd stimulate at the optimal place, and that would be the place you would try to put your biological pacemaker, okay? But no, we haven't gotten to that stage. We're, we're only at the stage where 
we've shown proof of principle. Uh, it's either too expensive, like it is with the, uh, which would have worked, or uh, we just have to optimize the construct for whatever application we choose as our first application, and, and then just go do it. Is the point? So, can, can you control the, the voltage of the stem cells? I mean, it might be possible to um, rig it so that if you can control the voltage of the stem cell, that you could electroporate the siRNA into the target cell. So, the the, the problem uh, you could change the voltage of of the uh, HMSC, but that induces differentiation, uh, fat cartilage and bone mostly. I think at the same time, I mean, just uh, to bring the other perspective is the electronic pacemaker. They're getting are, better and better. Very good job. Oh, yeah. I, I'm and, also, and also they can, with new technologies like uh, batteries. Uh, and, yeah, uh, I agree with you 100%. No, 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 I'm just yeah. my, my thinking. Yeah. And also with things like artificial intelligence and so on, you can teach those and build all kinds of algorithms that will... Very so if you have A V block. If, if yeah, to yeah if, if you have A V block and you want to have autonomic responsiveness, all you need is a sensor by the SA node and feed forward to the ventricular um, uh, stimulator. So there are things that can simulate. And uh, I I would suspect that if this were to work perfectly it would be a good replacement, okay? If it worked any less than perfectly, it would not be, okay? And... Um, I think it's all a question of cost-benefit. If, if, if it's a thousand if, bucks... If the improvement in uh, electronic placement will be tremendous and will, uh, then, then somebody will invest in it, but if not, then... In, in our case... Walking around yeah. with pacemakers and the, I, I compare a biological pacemaker um, to LASIK surgery. So uh, I play a lot of tennis. And in my 50s, my son was going off to college. And he, after his freshman year, he decided he would be much more attractive to the female population if he didn't wear glasses. And when he tried contacts, he got a lot of infections in his eye. And so we said, fine, we'll do LASIK. And it, it worked. I mean, both ways. I mean, his eyes were good, <laughs> and apparently it worked in the other way as well. Um, uh, but then I had LASIK, and I view that as a biological pacemaker. It's just a biological solution that's possibly simpler than glasses. Um, uh, and the answer is, once you do it with LASIK, uh, it ends up cheaper because you don't have glasses until you need your reading glasses, which you can buy for 10 bucks anyway. So, um, no, it's, uh, with the biological pacing, at the time we started, um, uh, it had a, a greater view to me. And um, uh, we got um, five years of funding from Boston Scientific. Uh, initially, it was Guidant that funded us. And they gave us $10 million. It was uh, Mike Rosen and me and Rich Robinson. And, uh, what happened is when the company was taken over, they were no longer interested in the biological pacemaker. So they fulfilled their contract and gave us this money, but they didn't do the long-term studies for six months on this and nine months on that. The concept, <laughs> concept is attractive because people like to replace biology by biology. Yeah. And not to introduce what is considered as a foreign entity, which is some electronic yeah. electronic. And I found it interesting to learn that business does intrude when we were successful, but it would cost too much. So therefore, we had to go in another direction. Well, thank you all for listening. I much appreciate it.